Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our first meeting of the NASA Advisory Council for 2019 at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. I'm Diane Roush, Executive Director of the NASA Advisory Council. I would like to call this meeting to order. I have a few administrative announcements before we begin. The NASA Advisory Council is a federal advisory committee established under the Federal Advisory Committee Act, FACA. As such, our council meetings today and tomorrow are open to the public. Please note that although this is an open meeting, we kindly ask the public not to interrupt our speakers or council members before, during, or after their presentations. In compliance with the FACA federal statute, formal minutes are being taken throughout our meeting today. These minutes are for the public record, hence all presentations, discussions, and comments by speakers and council members should be considered to be on the record. Most of the members of the NASA Advisory Council have been formally appointed to their advisory positions because they are individual subject matter experts. These These members are subject to, to the federal ethics laws. The category of appointment is called Special Government Employee, SGE. All SGEs on the Council should remember to please recuse yourself from the meeting if a topic comes up in which you have a potential conflict of interest between your financial interests, including those of your employer, and any matters we are discussing at this meeting of the NASA Advisory Council. If you have any questions related to ethics issues, please see me separately, and if needed, I will put you in contact with, with one of our NASA ethics attorneys. Our attorneys will be happy to answer any and all of your questions. A reminder to the public that all food and beverages being offered today and tomorrow are for council members only. The public is invited to purchase refreshments nearby. Council members, please be sure to wear your name badges at all times so that everyone can identify you. Council members, just a reminder that in addition to the public attending our meeting in person today and tomorrow, the virtual public is also attending our meeting in real time by dialing in and using WebEx online throughout our meeting. In addition, we are pleased that NASA TV is televising live the first part of our NAC meeting today from 1030 until 12 noon. To ensure that our public hears all of our NAC deliberations throughout the day today and tomorrow, we would ask that you please speak very clearly into your microphone each time you offer comments to the Council. Please remember to turn on and turn off your mic each time you speak. We would like to ensure that all members of the public in attendance here at NASA headquarters and our virtual public in cyberspace hear you loudly and clearly throughout our NAC meeting. Thank you for your time and attention to these administrative details. It is my honor at this time to introduce the chair of the NASA Advisory Council, General Lester L. Lyles, who will lead this meeting over the next two days. General Lyles, the gavel is yours. Diane, thank you very much and good morning, everybody. Uh, for those on NASA TV and those in the public who are joining us, uh, welcome to this session, of, uh, actually our first in 2019, of the NASA Advisory Council. Uh, as Diane mentioned, our role is to advise the, the NASA Administrator, the Honorable uh, Jim Bridenstine, of all the things related to NASA and its various missions, from space to aeronautics to science, uh, you name it. Everything that's in the mission jar for uh, the NASA uh, organization is something that we advise Jim on and help him in terms of running this great organization. This is very a very exciting time for NASA. I think it's a very exciting time uh, for our country in some respects relative to space and aeronautics. And we're pleased to have this role of doing this sort of advisory function. I'm also pleased that we have such a stellar, wonderful organization uh, that's responsible for taking this on. Uh, I'm going to ask each one of them to go around our table here in our room to introduce themselves with just a brief comment about their name uh, and a little bit about their background so you also can get a feel of who it is that's doing this particular role for the NASA mission and for the NASA administrator. Uh, with that, I'm going to start with Dr. Penny Axelrad. Thank you, General Lyles. Uh, my name is Penny Axelrad. I'm a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder uh, in the Aerospace Engineering Sciences Department, and my expertise is in GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite Systems, and Position Navigation Technology. Great. Thanks, Penny. John? Yes. Well, my name is John Bergese. I'm um, um, a uh, member of United Technologies. I'm responsible for advanced research for mission systems in Collins Aerospace, and my background is basically many years in aerospace and particularly aviation. John, thank you. Minnie? My name is Minnie Wadwa. I'm director of the Center for Meteorite Studies and professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University. And my expertise is in the area of planetary materials analysis. Minnie, thank you. Alan? 
I'm Alan Epstein. I'm here as uh, chair of the Aeronautics and Space Engineering Board. I'm a professor emeritus at MIT, and I think the only person here who actually worked on the Apollo 11 landing. Amy? Good morning. I'm Amy Kennedy. I'm the senior vice president at Battelle Memorial Institute in Columbus, Ohio. I lead our education and philanthropy programs. I used to be a teacher and a high school principal, so education and STEM education is my specialty. Amy, thank you very much. Miles. My name is Miles O'Brien. I'm an independent filmmaker and journalist with about 30 years of experience covering uh, aerospace uh, for PBS, CNN, and others. Great. Uh, Jim? Jim Bridenstine, NASA Administrator. Great. Senator Bill Nelson. Bill Nelson, a retired public servant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're honored to have Senator Nelson as our newest member of our uh, advisory council. We'll get a chance to hear from him soon here. Pat? Um, Patricia Sanders, I chair of the NASA Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel. I have 34 years experience with the Department of Defense in um, aerospace um, test development um, management. And Pat, thank you. Lee? Good morning. Lee Levy, a background in the military. Uh, specializing in aerospace and nuclear operations, as well as logistics and uh, software development. Thank you. Wayne. Wayne Hale, I had a 32-year career with uh, NASA uh, flight operations for the shuttle and shuttle program management. I'm retired from the government now and work as a consultant for Special Aerospace Service. Wayne, thank you. Elizabeth? Elizabeth Petty Cornell, I'm Professor of Engineering at Stanford University in the Department of Management, Science, and Engineering. And my specialty is risk analysis and reliability of launch complex systems these days with major applications in cybersecurity and uh, space, aerospace uh, area. Elizabeth, thank you. Tony? Hi, my name is Tony Cole. So I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Ativo Networks, and my background is in cybersecurity as a member at large. And Krista? Good morning. I'm Krista Paquin. I retired from NASA about one year ago as the Deputy Associate Administrator for NASA, the number two career role. Prior to that, I was uh, managing all of mission support for NASA. That's been my specialty through my career. Great, Krista. Thank you. Krista is also one of our new members uh, at large to the NASA Advisory Council. We have one other member, uh, Jim Free, who I'm not sure is on the line yet. Uh, he's uh, with his son's graduation, which is where he should be. Uh, at this particular point, so he couldn't be here at the meeting. He also is a new member to the NASA Advisory Council. Well, I think you can understand why uh, I'm so proud and honored and humbled to have the opportunity to work with this uh, August group. And uh, without any further ado, I'd love to introduce uh, the Honorable Jim Bridenstine, the, on the uh, Administrator of NASA, who's going to give some remarks and also introduce Senator Nelson. Thank you, General Lyles. Uh, as always, uh, you do great work running this uh, council, and I'm grateful for all of your service to not just NASA, but to our nation, uh, because what we do is really important for our whole country, and in fact, for the world. Uh, a couple of things that I think um, I want to I want to address, uh, and I'm going to I'm going to be uh, speaking maybe for half an hour here, a little bit later, but in this this initial segment here, I want to. Uh, talk about a couple of things. Everybody is aware now that we are accelerating our return, or I should say our going forward to the moon. When I say we're going forward, it's because we're doing it in a way that's never been done before. We are going sustainably to the moon. Everybody is aware of that. I want to talk about a couple of things that are political in nature. People say, why? Why are we accelerating the path? There are two risks that we know from history that we have to deal with as an agency. One risk, of course, is technical. And I have every confidence that this agency can retire the technical risk to go to the moon and on to Mars, for that matter. The other risk that we deal with is political. And if you look at the history of the agency, um, we have had efforts in the past to go back to the moon and on to Mars, uh, and, and each of those efforts historically have failed. We talk about the Space Exploration Initiative. Um, going back to the 1990s. Um, that met with political resistance in the House and the Senate, and ultimately it never materialized. We talk about the vision for space exploration, another effort to go back to the moon and onto Mars, and um, it met with political resistance, 
and it never materialized. Here's the challenge. The challenge is that as programs go long, as they go you know, past their, you know, the, the, the life cycle of, of politics, if you will, budgets change, priorities change, Congresses change, administrations change, and all of this results in political risk. Again, NASA's really good at retiring technical risk. We have not been good in the past at managing the political risk. How do we retire as much as possible the political risk? Well, what we do is we accelerate. If we go faster, then there's less time. Um, if a program is going to take 15 or 20 years, that's going to endure a lot of budget cycles, a lot of political cycles, a lot of administration changes, that kind of thing. So what we're trying to do here is accelerate the plan to ensure success. That's what we're doing. So we talk about the political risk. That's really what the acceleration is about. One other element of politics that I think is important to note. When we got the new direction that we're going to go to the moon within five years, we got that new direction, um, we, we very quickly went to work to get an amendment to the budget request. And we got that. In a matter of six weeks, we were able to attain a $1.6 billion increase in our budget request to Congress. Now, we got that out the door the same week that the House Appropriations Committee was marking up their bill for NASA. And so people said, well, they, they, they rejected our proposal. Well, I want to be clear. That is not necessarily what that means. Um, I, I think it's important to note that um, the conversations I have had with members in the House, there's support for this effort on both sides of the aisle. Um, don't get me wrong. There are people that have questions or people that have concerns, people that are interested in where the money is coming from, that kind of thing. And I understand those concerns. But I think, in general, there's a lot of bipartisan support for an accelerated effort to get to the moon with kind of a new energy. And we're seeing that. Now, we got the amendment to the Hill the same week the House was marking up their bill. The idea that they were going to incorporate in the, in the in $1.6 billion new dollars for human exploration and operations, and by the way, the Science Mission Directorate and the Space Technology Mission Directorate, within days of us getting the amendment over there is just not realistic. Um, it is absolutely true that the House mark actually pluses up NASA's budget significantly in positive ways, especially on the Science Mission Directorate side. That's a very positive thing. Um, the next step in the process is what does the Senate do? And when we talk about the Senate, I can tell you uh, a lot of people in this room saw a tweet from uh, Senator Moran, and he went public and he said he wants to work with the President and the Vice President and the NASA Administrator to make certain that we have the resources necessary to get to the moon. He sent that tweet. That's very positive from the gentleman who is the chairman of the Commerce, Justice, Science, Appropriations Committee in the Senate. And, and, and that's the committee that funds NASA. So let's, let's pretend that the Senate were to pass a bill that, that, that supports the $1.6 billion, the additional money necessary to accelerate our path to the moon. And we have the House that has plussed up the, the science mission directorate. All this does is it starts the political negotiation in conference for ultimately the, what, how the House and the Senate resolve those differences. What I am saying is I have read reports that it was dead on arrival because of what ultimately the House of Representatives, uh, what their mark looked like. And I'm here to tell you that is not the case. Um, th this, is, this is the beginning of the path to the moon. And people have said, well, we're in the second inning. I'm here to tell you, I think we're at the, we're, <laughs> we're at the top of the first inning. Um, and, and we are going through a process right now to communicate and educate and share these, these concepts and ideas with legislators in a very positive, a positive and meaningful way in an effort to retire the political risk. That's what we're trying to do here. Part of that effort, um, I thought it was important that we would have somebody serve on this committee who understands the political risk, who understands the history, who has fought these battles in the Senate for years. And when we think about how we're going to get to the moon and on to Mars, we're going to do it, friends, with an SLS rocket, an Orion crew capsule, and a European service module. These capabilities are available to this country. This is hardware right now. I just saw a picture yesterday. The oxygen tank, the inner tank, uh, the hydrogen tank, 
they're all put together now down at the Mishu assembly facility down in New Orleans. Th this is the legacy of a senator who has worked in a very bipartisan way to make sure that NASA can continue moving forward. Um, and I am, I am thrilled that he's not just a senator that has worked on these issues for so many years, but he is also somebody who has spent time with the astronaut corps, going through training, flying into space, coming home, and then taking all of what he learned uh, to the United States House and then the United States Senate in a very positive way that's been great for this agency. So with all of that said, um, again, we're working to make sure that we have strong bipartisan support so we can get um, the $1.6 billion necessary to get us to the moon and then on to Mars. And this is the first step in a long process, but I think we're making very strong headway. And I'd like to turn it over to my friend, Senator Bill Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. Um, not only am I honored by being uh, a part of what has historically been so very important for NASA, which is uh, an outside advisory council. Uh, but I'm honored that the administrator would ask me to come back and be a part of the NASA family. Uh, and it is a family. Uh, and uh, Miles and I have seen when that family uh, has had loss in the past, and that whole family comes together. Uh, and now we have a, a very, very exciting future. As we discussed earlier today, uh, this is a tough time for the administrator because if you think back on the extraordinary success of the Apollo program with the full weight of the White House, with the articulation of a president that uh, those words continue to ring in our ears, that we're going to the moon by the end of the decade and return safely. And that became the mission. Remember the environment back then. We were in the great space race. Uh, we had been beat by the Soviets first on orbit with Sputnik, and then they shocked us with Gargarin, and we were still trying to get off the ground just into suborbit with Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom, and they did Titoff then with three orbits after Gargarin. Uh, and then, of course, the nation's eyes focused on John Glenn climbing into that Atlas rocket that had a 20% chance of failure, and the rest is history. But the whole nation was galvanized behind the space program and therefore, the political will was there to put the money to the program. Now we have such a different political environment. One of the good things is that NASA is still not only a bipartisan agency, it is a nonpartisan agency. It, like the Defense Department, and the intel agencies. There's no place for partisanship in this agency or this NASA family. And it's because of that is that this agency <coughs> under these times of difficulty in getting money appropriate, not only in just having the available resources to appropriate, but also in these times of exceptional uh, partisan uh, acrimony, uh, as well as ideological rigidity that makes the functioning of the legislative branch of government uh, all the more difficult. So the administrator really has a Herculean task uh, to now get the, the support 
that the White House has come out, and my hat's off to the Vice President uh, as the Chairman of the Space Council, which was a good move. Put the Space Council so you get that focus right with the imprimatur of the White House. Uh, and now that uh, the statement has been made 1.6 plus up, we want to accelerate the SLS program. Uh, indeed, now where's the money? And that's going to be uh, the task, uh, a very, very tough task for the administrator. I might say that uh, a lot of the assets in Congress that you could call on in the past uh, have retired. Uh, remember, it was Kay Bailey Hutchinson who was so key back in 2010 on the passage of putting NASA on the new course in the NASA authorization bill of 2010. Uh, remember, you always had a go-to on the Appropriations Committee with Barbara Mikulski, uh, as well as Kay. Uh, remember, over on the House side, John Culberson, Dutch Rupersberger, uh, Lamar Smith, always go-to people uh, in the space program. And um, now, fortunately, uh, we still have Richard Shelby, uh, who will serve out the remainder of his term for another three and a half years as someone that is go-to. I think the deputies, the deputy administrator's relationship uh, with the Senate leadership, particularly Senator McConnell, is going to be a significant plus. But this is going to be a trying time. Finally, I just want to say that things are going to get uh, exciting because we're going to start launching Americans on American rockets. And there's nothing that will uh, gather the attention and the admiration of the American people to see an American soaring into space. Back in the Apollo days, uh, it was so well said with the adage, no Buck Rogers, no Bucks. Uh, soon there are going to be a lot more Buck Rogers that are going to be flying from U.S. soil on American rockets. And that's going to grab the attention of the American people. And I can tell you, you are seeing it already. You ought to see the, the crowds down at the Cape when we are launching these commercial rockets. And they're coming out on the beach and over on the Indian River shoreline at Titusville and along the causeways. And then when they see those two boosters coming back simultaneously landing, they're cheering. They are ready to get out there and start cheering when we launch American astronauts on American vehicles. And that's going to help the administrator, the entirety of NASA, as uh, we are going forward on our program to go back to the moon, the gateway, and ultimately to Mars. It's an exciting time, and I'm just very privileged to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Senator Nelson, thank you very much for those very inspiring and, and very cogent words. Uh, I will tell you that uh, we're all very excited to have the opportunity both to learn from you and to work with you as part of our NASA Advisory Council mission. So thank you. It's an honor to have you as part of our body. Uh, for our meeting today, this public session, the first thing we have on our agenda is an update uh, from the Chief Financial Officer uh, on the budget, the FY2020 budget, including this budget amendment. So, um, Brian, Dewhurst. Brian, Dewhurst. Brian Dewhurst, good to see you again, Brian. Thank you. Yeah, so it says Andrew Hunter, but 
Andrew Hunter's last day in the agency is tomorrow, so I think he's down trying to figure out how to archive his email or something. <laughs> so, so here I am. Um, we rolled this budget out on March 11th. It was $21 billion for the agency, and that was a strong budget, um, especially in the broader fiscal constraints uh, the nation has right now. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so the $21 billion budget we rolled out uh, was a strong budget. It had us going back to the moon in 2028. Uh, then the vice president made his speech two weeks later, and we got back to work. And a couple weeks ago, the administration released an amendment to that budget, which provided another $1.6 billion for NASA in order to accelerate our return to the moon from 2028 to 2024. Uh, I'm going to mostly talk about um, the budget at a very high level, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have um, further down in the details if you'd like. Just uh, the chart, we're sticking with SPD-1, you know, the, uh, the President's directive um, telling us to go back to the moon and using all means necessary. So this is the underpinnings that we built the budget around. Uh, here you have some of the, then the highlights. So we have $22.6 billion now that includes the $1.6 billion budget amendment. Uh, 12.3 billion of that uh, is continuing the key components of the exploration campaign, including SLS, Orion, um, the Lunar Gateway. It also includes our space station and some of um, the other capabilities we have to support human spaceflight in our space operations account. So that's that 12.3 billion dollar numbers. It's more than the moon directly. It's uh, the broader exploration campaign. Pieces of science are in there as well. Um, the news is the Lunar Gateway. Um, Again, the budget amendment f narrowed the focus of the Lunar Gateway down to those systems that are required specifically for the 2024 human landing. That's the power and propulsion element and then a, a mini hab. Um, all of those pieces will be launched on commercial launch capabilities. Uh, SLS will be for, and Orion will be for crew uh, delivery only, at least up through 2024. Uh, we also have lunar landers. Uh, this is the CLIPS program in science. It's commercial uh, lunar payload services. Um, to deliver, start to deliver cargo, and then um, growing into human access landers uh, toward the end of the decade, or I'm sorry, toward the end of the window. Uh, and we're doing all of this with commercial and international partnerships along the way. So here are the numbers themselves. I'm going to pause just for a couple things on this table. Um, you can see the columns in yellow there. You have uh, our initial request that came out on the 11th of March. You see where the amendment put the money and then our total. Uh, the other thing I'd like to point out just about the budget in general uh, is down here in this top line um, in the out year. So in the past few years, uh, we have been required to say that our out years are flat and notional. Um, those of you who have been around Washington know that every out year budget is notional, whether we call it that or not. <laughs> but that means something very actually specific in Budget Geek world where I live. What that meant basically was that there was no political commitment by the administration to those numbers beyond the year that they were putting the budget out. They were there for NASA to be able to plan and to give some insight ahead as to where we could be going, but there was no commitment. This year, um, we do not have flat numbers. We actually had 1% 1 1 growth off of that um, $21 billion base year by year, and that is, OMB says, is not notional. It's actually a commitment by the administration to NASA that NASA would continue to grow. Now, every budget year is its own year. That doesn't mean that uh, necessarily we're going to be exactly at 21.2 um, in 2021, but it, the, the broader commitment that NASA will be growing and will get the resources it needs to achieve its goals is there. So that's why I would call out uh, the out years uh, and that lack of notionality um, as we put it forward. Uh, Couple other key things. Could I could I uh, interrupt here? Okay, so uh, I think the, a couple of things to point out here. We look at the year 2020. Uh, we just got an amended budget request, which now uh, the House and the Senate have. Um, and in that amended budget request, you can see. Um, so look at the the column 2020, the amendment. Um, the exploration systems development is 651 million dollars. That is, uh, that is specifically for SLS, um, because X SLS, as people are aware, um, is going longer than anticipated. And so we, we requested $651 million additional dollars uh, to get the SLS back on track. Um, 
Right under that, you see the $723.7 million. That's the exploration, research, and development line. Uh, that really, um, think of that as a $1 billion request for lunar landing capability. So we go from the gateway down to the surface of the moon and back to the gateway, procuring that as a service. That's a $1 billion price tag uh, in the budget request, but it only says $723 million. Why is that? Because uh, we de-scoped the gateway. Instead of having a large habitation module, we now have um, what we call a mini-hab or utilization module that is focused on us getting down to the surface of the moon. Um, so it's really, think of it as a way to transfer from the Orion crew capsule to the lander, get down to the surface, back to the gateway. Um, you can also see, as we move forward with this agenda, we have exploration technology that we're going to need. What that means is how do we learn how to live and work on the surface of the moon? Um, how do we utilize the resources of the moon, the water ice that's there? So we have $132 million additional dollars for, for, the, for STMD, the Space Technology Mission Directorate, to help us figure those things out starting even in 2020 so that when we do send humans to the moon uh, in 2024, uh, we're going to have capabilities that they're going to be able to take advantage of. If you look at the Science Mission Directorate, um, you see there there's $90 million new dollars for the Science Mission Directorate. Um, this is really focused on CLIPS, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services capability. We are buying access to the moon as a service for small payloads. This is independent of the gateway, but it could include the gateway in the future. But really, this is, a, this is our ability to get small payloads. We're talking about 15, 20 pounds science missions to the surface of the moon so that ultimately when our crew does go to the moon, we have very um, real science um, work for them to do based on what we have already learned. Um, so you look at this amendment, um, as, as you mentioned, it puts us at about $22.6 uh, billion, which is a strong, strong budget request. It is also true that this is the budget request for 2020. I want to I reiterate that. That's the budget request for 2020. When you think about 2021, you know as well as I know that we're going to need additional funds for 2021, 2022, 2023, and 2024 because it's going to cost us money to go to the moon in an accelerated uh, path. Um, there are trades that we are working through one year at a time uh, with, within the administration, and, um, and we will be proposing the budget request for 2021 uh, when, the, when the time is right for that. Um, so I've, I've heard people say, well, how come, how come we don't have, you know, the, the, the whole cost of the whole program between now and 2024 when we send uh, the next man and the first woman to the South Pole of the Moon, in, in, you know, within five years? How come we don't have that total amount? Um, the, the, the budgets in the United States are done one year at a time. We got what we needed for 2020. Uh, now we're working the political process on the Hill to make sure that it gets appropriated. In the meantime, we're negotiating within the administration for what are the trades necessary for 2021, ultimately to get to the end state, which is boots on the moon in, in, in 2024, the accelerated path um, to the moon. So those are, um, those are just some of, the, some of the thoughts. So thank you, Brian. Uh, Jim, the, uh, the 651 for SLS, uh, obviously that will stop any further slips, but is there any possibility of bringing the schedule back a little bit, back to the left as part of that? There is. We, we're looking at, at there's a trade space here as well as far as um, uh, ultimately how much testing we do in the green run. Um, some have suggested maybe we don't need a green run at all. Um, we're working through a process right now um, that has uh, completed itself through HEO. It's now at the office of the chief financial officer and um, we'll be getting feedback and they're looking at it from a historical perspective. Um, are, are the timelines that we're looking at correct? Um, but we're, we're looking at trades there. Um, we will have worked through that process probably um, by the end of June, early July, uh, and we'll be looking to, uh, to, to make, make a decision at that point. Can I see something? Yeah. Um, I, I think they have done things already or made some changes to, to bring schedule back because the 
integrating horizontally instead of vertically. Yes. There was a cost. There was a, I think. There was a cost for, for um, additional tooling to do that, but I think that was a smart decision. Yeah. Um, one that doesn't incur a lot of, a lot of extra risk, but but yeah. did buy some schedule. Back. So what we have done is we've 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 looked for, as Pat correctly identified, we've looked for those parts of the development that are in the critical path and we tried to remove them from the critical path. So we were having a hard time uh, you know, integrating the oxygen tank, the hydrogen tank, the inter tank, while we don't have the engine section complete yet. The engine section, of course, is the most complicated piece of the SLS rocket. So in order to start doing that integration, we bought tooling um, to, to, uh, to integrate in the horizontal down at Mishu, and, um, and now that process is well underway, and it's looking quite good, as a matter of fact. So we are doing things to accelerate the SLS development, um, and we've made investments to do that. Um, there is no doubt we're, we're slipping, uh, and I've been very clear about that. People are aware, um, and we're doing what we can to get back on track as much as possible. Brian, go ahead. A uh, couple more things I want to point out on here. Um, I want to look at the aeronautics account. Uh, because if you just look at it, it looks like uh, aerodynamics took a pretty big hit in this budget. That's actually an artifact of how we budget. Uh, and the, the short version, we have some capabilities in this agency that are unique in the nation, often in the world, in terms of our wind tunnels. Um, they are capabilities that the agency needs, human spaceflight needs them, science needs them, but we don't have everybody who needs them in every year. And in complying with fiscal law and in doing annual budgeting, that's kind of a tricky thing to juggle. Um, and so we made the decision for this budget to take the piece of the funding of aeronautics that was funding just the basic support of those wind tunnels and move it in its entirety um, to the safety, security, and mission services account. So that's why you, that's, that represents the entirety of that decrease. Otherwise, aeronautics is equivalent to the 19 level uh, in this budget. So that funding is still there. It's just in a different account. Still there. It's just in a different line. Good. Um, which strikes me, drags me to the safety, security, and mission services line where you'll see actually we propose a substantial increase uh, to that line. Part of that is the wind tunnels, but not all of it. Um, we are trying to make sure that our institution, some of which is quite old, was built for the last time we went to the moon, uh, is there to support the mission when the mission needs it. And so there's a significant investment both in our um, ongoing maintenance within the SSMS line and in our construction uh, line down here in order to bring the agency back up um, in terms of its physical plant. I'll say there's still a lot of work to do. This increase uh, in the construction account will um, improve our uh, capital refresh rate from once every 300, every 300 years to once every 240 years. Uh, still a long time, but a lot better. Uh, and we continue to work on making that better. Any other questions on this one before I go? I love this. I'm a budget guy. Tables are my thing. So. <laughs> I go to other stuff. Um, so this is just shown in the exploration campaign as it was originally in the request. Um, you can imagine another $1.6 billion here in that blue edge, that blue edge at the top um, is the exploration R&D. Uh, where we have gateway and lander, uh, and then the orange is exploration systems. So between those two, there'd be another 1.6 in 2020. But it just shows um, how this is expected to flow and where the growth is supposed to, is expected to be as we get into those out years. And so then just a few highlights. Uh, we've talked about um, CLIPS. This is the CLIPS bullet. Our exploration technology account, the Space Technology Mission Directorate, has the Lunar Surface Innovation Initiative. Um, to, to improve some of the technologies that we will need once we are actually on the lunar surface, including surface power uh, and ISRU. Uh, we've got the lunar robotic rover capability um, that we're working on. And of course, we've still got space station. We're doing all the work we need to do on the space station uh, in order to uh, inform us going further. Brian, do you want to make a comment about uh, low Earth orbit and International Space Station, both in terms of the, the budget and uh, perhaps even what uh, where we are relative to beyond that budget? Right. So um, the budget for low Earth orbit, we have station has all of its requirements funded in this budget. Uh, transportation, operations, maintenance, research, all those things that we need uh, are funded in 2020 uh, and, and into the out years. 
There's also $150 million in this budget as there was uh, proposed last year, and we got $40 million um, for 19 to uh, start our commercial LEO transition. This is trying to figure out what's next, right? And I think the goal of the agency, um, the administrator can jump in, but the goal of the agency is to try to make that a smooth transition from station to whatever our next LEO capability is with no gap, those sorts of things, and we're figuring out the right way to do that now. So we have that investment in place as well in this budget. It grows into the out years, and we'll try to make that a smooth switch from one to the other. Fair enough. Great. Yeah. So we still uh, have a strong science program. Um, we got Mars 2020 uh, still on track for launch in 2020. And we have the Europa Clipper mission to launch in 2023. This is on an EELV. Um, we don't have SLS for that in this budget. My understanding is that technically we don't have to make that decision until into this fall, until into next fiscal year. So we've still got time ahead of us. The law does tell us to launch that on SLS. And as the minister says, we'll follow the law. But we don't have to make that decision technically quite yet. We're also starting a Mars sample return mission. Uh, this is to go get the samples that Mars 2020 will be caching and bring them back to Earth. Uh, we've talked about it for a long time. This is the first time it's finally got budget here in the in the budget proposed. It starts with about $100 million uh, in 20 uh, and works to be launched by the end of next decade. Uh, Web, we, uh, we'd hoped to have it launched by now, but uh, this budget supports it. Uh, to be launched in 2021, everything they need to get to 2021. Web is still fully funded. However, there has been sort of a trade there. Um, the budget does not provide any funding for W First, not because anybody thinks W First is a bad mission. It was the number one decadal survey recommendation uh, and realizes that, but it's simply trying to make the available dollars fit uh, and need to fully fund Web. Um, w First unfortunately got squeezed out in this one. Uh, we have our wide ranging science work continues. It's support uh, 10,000 scientists a year on 3,000 or so grants every year for research, ongoing research. And then consistent with our prior budgets, um, we do not provided funding for PACE, Clario, or the Office of STEM Engagement. Um, these historically have been funded by uh, the Congress when we have taken them out uh, in budgets, but this budget repeats that pattern. In Aero, um, we have funding for the X-59 Quest Flight Demonstrator. This is the low boom flight demonstrator. It's got, it got its X designation. Um, we're also making our investments in the air traffic management and talking about uh, urban air mobility. And those are two main priorities in Aero in this budget. Uh, and then here's the bullet about the mission enabling services and operations, making sure that the institution is there to support the mission and, and the increase I talked about earlier in SSMS and construction. So that's everything. Jim, I think it might be helpful, um, notwithstanding the um, uh, reduction in the STEM engagement uh, office, uh, we all know uh, your personal commitment to STEM and, and STEM um, uh, activities, if you will, and the importance of STEM, particularly for the future workforce for, for NASA in addition to the, the rest of the country. Uh, it, any thoughts about ways that, uh, notwithstanding any budget upput, uh, updates by the Congress, ways that you could still put emphasis on STEM activities without that, uh, that budget? Uh, absolutely. And, um, you know, the, the, the reality is uh, we are an agency that is funded by Congress, and Congress has told us to continue uh, operating the Office of STEM Engagement, and we, and we, we do that. We, we absolutely, as you correctly said, we will follow the law. Um, it, it is also true, um, you know, that we do a, a lot of things um, outside the Office of STEM Engagement to uh, inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers. One of my favorite programs um, is, is FIRST Robotics, um, which of course is a, a, a program that is nationwide and it gets uh, really kids as young as elementary school all the way into high school um, really a, a kind of addicted to building robots that are competing in very serious competitions all, all around the country in a way that is engaging, that's fun, it's stimulating. Um, and I've had the opportunity to, um, to participate in these first robotics competitions. And all of that is funded uh, through the Science Mission Directorate. So what, the question is, why does the Science Mission Directorate um, find it in its interest to fund these activities? 
Well, if, if, if you look at the scientists that, that build, or the engineers and the scientists that build our robots that are operating on Mars or our satellites that are flying past um, Ultima Thule or, um, you know, in orbit around Bennu, what you'll find is a lot of these, a lot of these really impressive folks participated in FIRST Robotics 10 years ago. Um, and so 10 years from now, um, the question is, you know, are these FIRST Robotics kids um, going to be building the rovers and the landers and the satellites and the, the probes of the future? And I, I think the answer to that is yes. We get a direct return on that investment. Um, and so, yeah, the Science Mission Directorate does um, make investments from a personnel perspective, from a mentorship perspective. Uh, we provide tooling, uh, and in fact, we, we sponsor their activities um, through grants and, and other things. So um, I, I think it's a, a really good program, and, and there's, there's other programs, but there's ways that our mission directorates um, can su support STEM as well. Great. All right, anything else? Yes, any other questions relative to the budget? Yes, um, so um, I really commend you, Administrator Bridestown, on, on this uh, really forward-looking vision, I think, of the Artemis program that you have, which I think it has a really strong feedback between science and exploration, which is fantastic. Um, and as, as Senator Nelson very eloquently said, there's going to be a lot more Buck Rogers, but also I'll, I'll say a lot more Betsy Rogers as well, yeah. which is going to be fantastic. But, you know, there is there's, uh, there's political and fiscal reality which you talked about and challenges there. Um, there's obviously the request and then there's going to be the fiscal reality, the budget reality. And so I just wanted you to maybe outline sort of broad principles of how you would plan to reprioritize the NASA budget in light of the fiscal reality in terms of the budget reality being somewhat let, falling short of the budget request, if you will. Sure. So um, our our agency has been um, making progress in a number of ways, uh, reprioritizing to accelerate the path to the moon. I think one of the first things that that we talk about is gateway. Um, you know, we we are actually making an effort um, to reduce the size and scope of gateway for the accelerated path to the moon. Uh, to get to the surface of the moon, we need a lander. Um, and the gateway uh, is, is really a critical element of getting to the surface of the moon, no doubt about it. Um, but we don't need all of the elements of, of the gateway in 2024. We can, we can have it grow beyond that, and we can have international partners uh, and even commercial partners um, add to the gateway in future years. Um, so right now we're focused on the gateway being used specifically to get us to the surface of the moon. Um, so that was one kind of reprioritization. I would also say, uh, as we go forward, trying to figure out how we transition. And we all know, um, you know, the, you know, there's been a lot of concern about the ending of direct funding for the International Space Station in the year 2025. Um, that that has been removed in the budget request that is currently before the House and the Senate. It is also true that we all know that the space station can't last forever, and what comes next. Um, and we think it's important that commercial industry drive that, that capability. And there's pharmaceutical capabilities, there's uh, material science capabilities, uh, there's tourism capabilities, there, there's all kinds of industrial kind of uses um, for habitation in low Earth orbit that could be driven by the private sector, and then we can use our resources to do things that only government right now is willing and able to do, namely uh, go to the moon and then on to Mars. Um, so I think uh, that's another kind of uh, reprioritization. Uh, within the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate, um, we're looking at standing up a new division that is focused on the moon and eventually Mars as well. And right now in that mission, that division within the Human Ex Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate, um, elements of the gateway will be uh, housed inside that division as well as the landing capability on the surface of the moon. Um, so uh, we're making some, I think, significant modifications to, um, or I should say reprioritizations and organizational changes necessary to, uh, to help us achieve this goal. John? Yes, uh, just to continue what uh, Mina said, um, 
I, I just like to talk a little bit about a very small but very important part of the budget was which is astronaut aeronautics, aeronautics. And, um, uh, and what I see in aeronautics right now is it's undergoing a revolution based upon a number of new technologies whether it be electric propulsion or autonomy or a hundred other technologies that are enabling new types of vehicles uh, to enter the the aviation community and so we could come up with growing from 50 to 60,000 operations per day to over a million. And that's not going to happen without the leadership of NASA. And I, and I, I really applaud the uh, aeronautics uh, uh, directorate in, in, in advancing that technology uh, for the future, which is vital and will touch every American in this country over the next 20, 30 years. So I'd like to, could you give this your vision yeah. relative to aeronautics? So it's important, here's what I think is important to remember. Um, if, if you go back to the Apollo program, um, the way we navigated was inertial navigation systems. Those are, those are systems that were built for aviation and in fact tested by aviation capabilities. Um, the aeronautics piece of what NASA does is critical for exploration. And the exploration piece of what NASA does is, is critical for, for aeronautics. Some perfect examples, you know, we, you mentioned, um, you know, how to, aer, aeronautics, w w aeronautics is critical to getting to the moon. Think about the history. I mentioned inertial navigation system. We think about wind tunnels. Wind tunnels are a, a capability that is necessary. Look, if you're going to fly into space, you've got to get through the atmosphere. That means we need, we need wind tunnels. We need computational fluid dynamics. All of these capabilities developed for aviation apply to what we do for spaceflight. Um, and so aeronautics is a key piece of, of who we are as an, as an agency. You mentioned specifically electric propulsion and you mentioned autonomy. Electric propulsion, how do we store large volumes of elect electricity for long periods of time. That's a, that's a challenge for flying people across the country in the atmosphere. It's also a challenge for fly flying people in space. So again, here you have a capability that is for aviation that we are developing within the Aeronautics Mission Directorate that applies directly to what we eventually want to do, not just in space, but on the surface of the moon. You have to be able to store power, large amounts of power for long periods of time. Autonomy. Um, we need to be able to, to land. We need, first, we need to be automatic rendezvous and docking capability. We need to, to precisely land on the surface of the moon, potentially autonomously. So there's a lot of autonomy that, that develops. We go back to the inertial navigation systems coupled with an autopilot. That's, in essence, autonomy. All of that applies to spaceflight as well. We talk about inertial navigation smoothed with GPS and using that to um, you know, gimbal the, the engines on a rocket. That's all autonomy as well. So the, the aeronautics mission directorate is an absolute key piece to what we do when it comes to space flight. Um, I was talking, in fact, yesterday um, with Janet Cavandi, one of our astronauts who now runs the Glenn Research Center up in Cleveland, Ohio. And, um, and she was talking about um, the uh, the ground warning um, jip the uh, ground the ground warning proximity system, ground warning proximity system um, which uh, which ultimately uh, you know we, we flew with in the military but now it's being automated in a way where if the pilot is not responding to what the computer is saying the pilot ought to do the plane takes over and general you're probably aware we we have because of NASA technology developed for the space shuttle, that technology is now being embedded in F-16s and F-15s, and it's saving lives. I think at this point there is a record of like nine humans who have been saved by the JIPWIZ being automated, um, coupled with a smart aircraft, if you will. Um, so it, it goes both ways. What we do in aeronautics applies to space, and what we do in space applies back to aeronautics. And so the, the aeronautics, mission, aeronautics Research Mission Directorate of NASA is a key piece of, of the overall puzzle. So I, I know sometimes it gets dismissed because it doesn't have a big piece of the budget, but it is critical. Hey, 
Uh, the first A in NASA is aeronautics. And uh, all of the next generation of uh, flight control uh, that is so essential for the economy of this country because what is happening is our airports, our flight uh, paths are getting so clogged, we've just simply got to be able to be more efficient in getting an airplane from point A to point B and to do that safely. Now, fortunately, uh, the Congress just passed a five-year FAA bill, which will give some more certainty than what has been in the past, where it was uh, a year-by-year -year approach and nobody knew what the continuity was. But it still uh, is going to come back to uh, appropriations, not only for the NASA research, uh, as the cockpit of the future is going to have situational awareness of everything about him because of the signals that are coming off of all of the satellites. It's going to need appropriations for the FAA as well, as they are, because of money, getting extended on the implementation of the next generation uh, system. Any other comments? Questions? General? Yes. Um, thank you. So I wanted to pause for a moment and talk a bit about safety, security, and mission services. This is the budget, the third largest budget cost account in the agency to support the infrastructure of the agency. And of grave concern is the 19 funding level. So we talked about getting that construction budget back up to $600 million. It had historically been at that level of $600 million. And even at that level, as Brian mentioned, we were on a pace to replace facilities every 237 years. Now, 83% of NASA's buildings are beyond their 50-year design life. Um, so the cycle was already very difficult to manage. Now, NASA's done an extraordinary job to try and manage that by having very aggressive reduce the footprint goals. I think they're looking to reduce footprint of facilities by 25% over a 20-year time frame. That only goes so far. Um, but 19 is what it is. As we think about Moon 2024 and Mars, there are implications for mission support. I mean, and this is sort of the thing people don't really like talking about. It's not sexy. But to do streamlined procurement methods, to have a different type of workforce with different skills as we move to this new way of doing things, it requires professional administrative support. Every time we rebaseline a budget, it's a heavy demand on the mission support community. And so it does raise some concern for me that there is nothing in the amendment to address that. Uh, I understand that you're trying to balance the budget, but as you think about planning going forward, I really encourage you to engage that community in the acquisition planning, facility planning, to really think about what's the flow down of these, these decisions uh, and the implications. Thank you. So Krista, that's why I'm so glad you're here, <laughs> because that's a voice that um, is rarely heard and yet critically important. Um, it, when, when we think about um, space flight, people think of rockets and they think about infrastructure, they think about basically launch pads and um, we, we talk about satellites and going to the moon. People don't think about the very basic infrastructure which is roads and bridges and buildings and um, having, having buildings that are not, you know, 60 years old um, or having our 60 year old buildings you know, be updated, <laughs> which most of them, as you mentioned, have not been. Um, so, uh, you know, we, there are a lot of people in Washington, D.C. that spend a lot of time on the Hill advocating for all kinds of programs and projects. There aren't anybody that I know of in Washington, D.C. advocating for the infrastructure of the centers throughout the agency. Uh, that might be one of the reasons it gets it gets dismissed so often, but it's a, it's critical, and we and we have to make sure that we're maintaining our, our capability there as well. So one piece of the, the construction budget uh, is a new building. I'm pretty sure it's at Langley. That building will be a new efficient building, and it will take down twice as much old inefficient square footage of building at the center, um, and consolidate the people into the one efficient. Um, building. So we're doing those sorts of things to try to bring that as much as possible on our side. Okay. 
you know, Chris, your comment is very appropriate, and so obviously so is Jim's. Uh, we, we in the NAC have really haven't looked at that area in great detail, and, uh, and I, I'll, I'll just make that a mandate that we will take a closer look at understanding what's going on there so we know exactly what the plans are, and more importantly, uh, how you're planning to allocate that. Uh, Brian, you mentioned Langley. Uh, but there are obviously other critical facilities that probably need to be addressed equally as important as, as Langley. So if you don't mind, uh, Jim, we'll take that as a task for the NAC to take a closer look at that area and be able to at least uh, give some uh, advice or thoughts or questions or, or even just questions about uh, about that whole area. Absolutely. So can thank I you for bringing on, that up. Can I pile on to this conversation? Yeah, please. Just one quick short story from history. When I moved into the shuttle program, office, my first job was infrastructure revitalization for the program. And in 2003, we authorized putting a new roof on the Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans in 2003. 43 acres, that was a pretty expensive roof. And I'm really glad we did because in 2005, we had Hurricane Katrina. And that facility survived very well. And if that facility had have failed, we would not have been able to fly out the rest of the space shuttle program. We would not have been able to complete the International Space Station, and you would not have the facility that's building the SLS today. So infrastructure revitalization, revitalization and update is critical to the mission. Absolutely. So I hope you don't mind an old war story. <laughs> no, we, we need those. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Brian, anything else? <coughs> Well, thank you very much. And uh, Jim, if you don't mind, I'll turn the floor over to you. Uh, uh, I know you've talked uh, sure. uh, of some of the key things you want to give us messages out to everybody, but uh, yeah. the floor is yours. Thanks, Brian. Good work. <laughs> Thanks, Brian, for that brief. Thank you all for your good questions. A um, couple of things that I want to, uh, to address. Um, I think one thing that's important, I listened in on the HEO NAC that ha what happened just a few days ago. Um, and, and I heard some people saying uh, that we need um, to go to the moon faster, maybe direct, maybe we don't need a gateway. I heard other people suggesting that, you know, we don't want to do flags and footprints again. We need more sustainability built into the architecture. How do we make it sustainable? Um, so I think given that there's some people on this side and some people on that side. If you look at where we are right now with Gateway, I think it's just about right, which is uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the power and propulsion element, and it's a mini-hab that ultimately enables us to get to the surface of the moon quickly to inspire that next generation. So that's really where we are right now. I will also say Gateway is critically important to get to the surface of the moon. When you think about SLS and Orion and the European Service Module, that capability alone can get down to low lunar orbit, but there's not enough delta V to get out of low lunar orbit. It can't do it. What does that mean? That means we need more delta V. We're gonna have to rendezvous somewhere. We're either gonna have to rendezvous in low lunar orbit with something else. Um, ultimately, what does that mean for us as an agency? That means that it ends up looking a lot more like flags and footprints. What Gateway does is it gives us that Delta V at a location around the moon where the Gateway can be for 15 years. It is a reusable command and service module that enables access to the surface of the moon, that enables presence around the moon for 15 years. It also has solar electric propulsion, which means that the gateway is maneuverable. It can get us to more parts of the moon than ever before. We think back to the Apollo era. From 1969 up until 2008, 2009, many people believed, I would argue most people believed, that the moon was bone dry. Then we made these significant discoveries that there's hundreds of millions of tons of water ice at the south pole of the moon, that the moon, in fact, has a water cycle we are creating new water, I say we. Nature is creating new water on the surface of the moon all of the time. Uh, and, and, and the question is, how do we get access to it and how do we utilize it? Well, we want more access to more parts of the moon than ever before. So we need a reusable command and service module in orbit around the moon permanently that is maneuverable, that allows our landers and our rovers and our robots and our humans access to the surface of the moon wherever we want 
whenever we want. That's what the gateway is all about. The gateway brings us something else. <coughs> if you look at the entirety of Space Policy Directive 1, yes, it's about going forward to the moon with commercial partners and international partners. It's about sustainably returning to the moon. That's what Gateway enables, sustainability. So we want access to the surface of the moon, we need Gateway. We want sustainability, we need Gateway. If we want more access to more parts of the moon than ever before, solar electric propulsion, we need Gateway. But the other value to Gateway is if you look at the entirety of Space Policy Directive 1, it also says that we're doing these things to eventually do a mission to Mars. The gateway is that element where we retire the risk for an eventual mission to Mars. Gateway is so important for so many reasons. Right now, the focus is to get to the surface of the moon. The next step is ultimately to bring sustainability by 2028 and then eventually go on to Mars. And for all of these things, the gateway is a critical piece of the architecture. And I really believe that. I will also say that um, when we think about where we are right now, um, we are in a very unique position. And I think Senator Nelson had it just right. This is a unique opportunity in our generation. <clears throat> I was not alive when we landed on the moon in 1969. I wasn't alive when we landed in 1972 for that matter. But here we are with a new opportunity to go forward to the moon with a sustainable architecture where we can have more access to more parts of the moon than ever before. We can actually have many missions on the surface of the moon all at the same time controlled from the gateway, either robotically or with a human in the loop. And we've got support from a budget request that says we're going to step forward and we're going to fund this and we're not going to cannibalize NASA in order to fund it. And we're, we're getting now bipartisan support in the House and the Senate. This is a very unique point in American history where uh, we have this opportunity that doesn't just come around every day. You know, I, I talked earlier, um, and I've talked about it a lot. I'm going to keep talking about it. Um, we, when we think about the 1960s and the 1970s and how proud we are of Apollo, what an amazing program. But in those days, all of our astronauts came from fighter pilots. They came fighter pilots, test pilots, and, and ultimately that's how they got into the astronaut. There were no opportunities available for women back then. And here we are, 50 years after Apollo, with a very diverse and qualified astronaut corps that can go to the moon. 50 years after Apollo. This is why I think I love the name Artemis for the program. Apollo, in Greek mythology, had a twin sister, Artemis, who happened to also be the goddess of the moon. And here we are 50 years after Apollo with a program to send not just the next man, but the first woman to the moon. This is an amazing opportunity. I've got an 11-year-old daughter. I've talked about this a lot. I want her to be able to see herself having every opportunity that I had. And I think this is what this program is all about. Um, so uh, with, with that, um, I, I really think this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. We need to seize on it. We need to do what is necessary to get the bipartisan support for uh, the, the, the 2020 budget and then um, start planning for 2021 and 2022. Um, with that, um, General Lyles, um, I'll just open it up for people to ask questions if you have thoughts and concerns. I'm happy to try to answer anything. Given the amazing talent in the room, I might have to defer some of the questions, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Jim, this is obviously not a technical question, but I, I just want to remind you, every time you mention that you weren't alive in uh, 1969, uh, some of us uh, are beginning to feel more and more ancient, if you will. But uh, just me more than anybody else, I'm sure. Uh, so this is the Artemis generation. And to just so you're aware, you could be part of both the Apollo generation <laughs> and the Artemis generation. <laughs> I, I, I love that. Well, it, it sort of puts a premium on something we talked about many times.
times. Uh, Miles O'Brien certainly has helped us in that regard. It's, and that is the, the messaging. Uh, how do we really make sure we convey, not just to us space zealots, if you will, uh, the importance of uh, a gateway, the importance of going back to the moon, uh, but the importance of the whole space program in this Artemis generation. I, I so, think of my, uh, my young daughters, my twin daughters, who are both uh, uh, very, very successful business women, if you will, uh, but they weren't there uh, in 1969 either, and they have a hard time understanding why are we putting so much energy, why is this so important to our country right now. So uh, we have a, a challenge in making sure we get the message out to this Artemis generation just to make sure, make sure we maintain their support for, for the future. If it's all right, General, would it be okay? What if we just went around the room and we asked people here why they believe we ought to be going to the moon? That's great. Or, as you mentioned, doing space exploration in general, whether it's the moon or onto Mars or, or just uh, even low Earth orbit. If um, I'll, I'll let you take control and we can go around the room and get people's... And, and the reason I, I want to do this is um, you walk around NASA, everybody is excited about going to the moon but everybody has very unique reasons. Like you will not get two answers that are the same as, as you go throughout NASA. So maybe we just open it up and let people talk about it. Oh, great, I'll, I'll start if you will. Uh, as some of you know, uh, uh, I was uh, given the honor of uh, chairing a National Academy of Engineering study several years ago on the rationale and goals for the US uh, civil space programs. Uh, and while we concluded in that particular study that we gave back to NASA, back to the administration, if you will, this is the beginning of the Obama administration, uh, while we concluded that there is a natural desire to explore, man's natural desire to explore, uh, one of the things that I think we really pointed out was that's not enough of a message uh, to the man on the street or the woman on the street. Uh, I'll never forget uh, everybody <laughs> concluding that everybody loves space. And I reminded everybody in that particular room, just so not too far from here, I'm from Washington, D.C. I can go out on 7th Street a block away and ask somebody what's happening with the, the space program, and nobody would know anything at all. But our major message was we need to make sure that our space program, whether it's lunar exploration or going back to the Mars, is connected to real challenges for our nation, for the world, whether it's climate control, whether it's uh, dealing with hunger, wh whatever, whatever it might be. We need to make sure there's connectivity to the things that are really, really relevant to people today. So to me, I'm a big believer, but a big believer in making sure that whatever we do connects to real world problems that people face today. That's great, yeah. Uh, Krista, we'll start with you. <laughs> yeah, so um, now's the time. The NASA brand is incredibly strong. I mean, to name a few Nikes using the, the logo. I mean, they're selling products across the nation and globally. Coach sells purses in Dubai and their windows uh, that have the NASA worm on them. The brand is strong. Now's the time because there's excitement about NASA. And we're still not there, but we're going there. And also, we have the commercial side bringing tremendous resources to the table. I'm not wrong, I don't think, in saying that Bezos is contributing a billion dollars of his own money every year. That's not a government contractor taking government funds to do this work. That's bringing it to the table. And so I think the community of our commercial partners and, and I think our, our, our constituents are ready for us to do this now. That's why 2024 matters a lot. Tony? Two things for me, and I think uh, one is the, the exploration and the science that's come out of everything we've done in the past that NASA's driven, so, and the technology transfer from that that's made our lives so much better. And I think that's great messaging that we should focus on what we've already got out of, you know, the efforts of NASA over the last, you know, uh, 50 years. And I think uh, the other piece is, I think, as Krista, you know, kind of started down that path, Nothing would unite humanity more, especially Americans, but humanity in general, to see somebody walking around on the moon in an international effort, so with commercial companies as well, and then talking about taking that next step. So, and I think that is, you know, a, a big driver for humanity is to, to explore beyond where we're from, you know, because today there's a, a phenomenal photo that, you know, everybody in here has seen, so that's got everything you've ever known is in this one tiny little dot, so of Earth. So, and this gives us that chance to step beyond that. That unity kind of uh, message, I think, is important. Um, it is at, Senator Nelson mentioned the political history between the Soviet Union and the United States and how that ultimately was a driver to the lunar landing in 1969. But it is also true that when that landing happened 
the whole world stopped. You know, the, people didn't just see America on the moon. <laughs> they saw humanity on the moon. And every nation in the world stopped what they were doing. People watched. Uh, people who didn't have television listened. And people who didn't have television or radio ultimately figured out a way to watch it later. <laughs> the whole world stopped in order to partake in that one moment, which I think was uh, inspirational. If you go around NASA, people will tell you exactly where they were when that happened. So I think that unity effort is, uh, is important. I was six and remember it. You were six. There you go. <laughs> Following on what General Lyles was saying, yes, exploration is in, man, in mankind's destiny. And I think that space right now is what the sea was in ancient times, but particularly, and, and then since then, in the 15th, 16th, 17th century. It's not only curiosity, it's a necessity. And so that's why I think that we're going to do it because we want to do it, because we have to do it. And that NASA is better equipped than anybody else or anything else to, to do it or to, in fact, help integrate all the efforts that exist in this country to actually do this exploration. Well, this is going to sound a little repetitive. When I was an engineering student at Rice University, they made me take go a... Go Owls. Yes, go <laughs> Owls. They made me take a history class, which is an engineer I really didn't appreciate very much, but it turned out to be maybe the most important class I took in four years. Dr. Garside taught it, and it was a history of the modern world, and his thesis throughout this whole class, which I resonated with, was that great nations are either in growth or decline, and great nations grow when they press the frontiers and expand into new areas and explore new frontiers, and if they're not doing that, they decline, and I have a whole half-hour talk that I could give you on that, but that's, <laughs> there, there are many reasons, but that's the primary one. Thank you, General. So, really two reasons, uh, Mr. Administrator. One is aspirational, and, and General Lyle said it incredibly articulately. Um, we, we as human beings have, are exploratory creatures by nature. It's in our DNA, if you will. Uh, and we use that tool of exploration and discovery to solve real-world problems here on Earth, make the quality of life better for the global citizenry that we all are a member of. But more locally, perhaps, we are an aerospace nation. Uh, the United States is an aerospace nation. Uh, if you think back to 1903, when the Wright brothers had their first flight, that flight could have occurred inside of the cargo bay of a U.S. Air Force C-5 Galaxy. <laughs> that entire flight. And now we're having a conversation about gateways and missions to Mars. The amount of uh, technology and innovation and passion that have been poured by this agency and this nation into that aspirational goal and the aerospace nation that we are as Americans is pretty astounding. And it really becomes that sort of beacon on, that shining beacon on the hill for others to focus on as we try to improve the quality of life here on the planet. So I, I think those two things intersect uh, incredibly well at this time in history that uh, under your leadership will get us back to the moon and beyond. It's really hard I, because I think they've given almost every region you could want, but, but it's um, having been part of the Apollo generation as well as it's, there's two things I would say. One, we went to the moon before, but it wasn't the same. It was, then it was the destination. Now it's part of the, the journey. And, um, and you know, we want to go be, because it's there. That's the way we are. I mean, you climb the mountain because it's there. You do these things because it's there, and you, you believe you can, and you want to prove you can. Um, also, I haven't been part of the Apollo generation. I resonate with you and your, what you're saying about your daughter. I, my time, you couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Yeah. I was prohibited, yeah. and um, and I wanted to. Yeah. And and now, now I'm too old. But <laughs> but, but your daughter's not. <laughs> so it's good. So uh, I was 10 years old 
when the landing happened. And uh, I consider myself uh, extremely fortunate to have been born when I was born, just to have lived uh, through uh, that experience. I feel like our generation was sort of sprinkled with moon dust, and it changed. Yeah, I remember Sister Grace Edwards rolling in the giant TV <laughs> and plugging it in, and we watched some of the Gemini launches. And it just you know, expanded our minds in ways that were impossible in 1966 and 1967 otherwise. So that there is a very important component of how this moves technology forward but how it, and develops technology, but how it also develops the future technologists. So it, it's important that we don't overlook this. When there's a zeroed out STEM budget, I know there's other ways we do this at NASA, and just by virtue of being of course, we don't roll in the carts anymore. It's all in the gadgets. But just by virtue of being there, we are giving a message to young people. But we can't leave that component behind. And while that development of technology and that development of a new generation of technologists is, is one thing, as a journalist, when I, I grew up, and people always ask me why I cover space, how many stories can you think of that command global attention? And I've been a part of some stories like that over the years that are positive stories. Mm -hmm. How many? I can't think of many others, right? And it's almost always is a space mission, whether it's a landing on Mars. We've had some negative bad days, too. We, we've all been there for that as well. But this goes back to what was said initially. We went in the middle of the Cold War in this hellacious rivalry with nuclear weapons pointed against each other. And when we landed, we all did it together. And we built a space station that was difficult and and sometimes I would be frustrated with NASA because they'd be focused on which widget attached to which nut in space and how cool that was. To me, the greatest accomplishment was the 16-nation, or whatever the number is, partnership. Where else has that happened in peacetime? Where else have we come together? We are in a world that is desperately needs things to bring us together. Space does that. It inspires, it creates new technology, and ultimately, even though it can be viewed as a race, and that's okay, it still in the end brings us together. So uh, somehow we got to get that in, in the messaging because I think when people hear those things, they get it. Um, I can think of no better way to inspire the next generation of innovators, change makers, and explorers than a very clear, exciting example of a great STEM problem solved by STEM folks who look and represent how our country looks and needs to be represented today and tomorrow. Boy, what tough acts to follow. Uh, I tend to be a widget and a nut guy, being an engineer. And That's OK. But, you got to have those two. To me, NASA is about exploration, and it does that extremely well. It's an operations thing, it's sort of okay. But there's times in, in society, and Apollo was about a focused national effort with NASA as its lead. We now have commercial space, which is transforming the capabilities of the nation to do things in space. And so it, NASA should get out of operations that space airlines, Pan Am, of course, didn't succeed in, in going into space. We'll see if Virgin Galactic does. But I think we have to remember that, as far as I can tell, there is very, very little new technology in commercial space. It's taking NASA-developed technology and using it in innovative business ways to generate new value. And so the importance of NASA focusing on both exploration and technologies appropriate for that exploration is more important now than ever because nobody else is doing it. Okay, so um, you know we already already heard that you know, exploration is in our DNA, but I, I I really feel that you know there are some real science drivers for going to the moon, and it's not just about making sort of those cool measurements with you know cool gizmos and and then geeking out over those 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 things. It's a it's really fundamentally about understanding our origins, about the origins of our planet, about the origin of our solar system, and there's really a lot of things that we can go to the moon and address those types of questions. You mentioned the fact that uh, the moon we thought of up until until recently, it was bone dry, but it's the technological advances that 
that have made it possible now to make those kinds of measurements now. And if you bring back samples from the moon where we've not been before, we've only really encompassed the Apollo program encompassed only about 6% of the surface of the moon. We, we barely scratched the surface there. And so I think, you know, bringing back those materials will really advance some of our really fundamental um, science questions as well. And, and it's about inspiring the next generation, too. I mean, I, th I feel strongly about that. Absolutely. John? So when I was a boy, I always wanted to be an engineer. But I became an electrical engineer because of what was going on. I would call it a revolution at the time in integrated circuits that led to, to microprocessors to eventually things like this. And um, those integrated circuits were, were matured. They would not have happened on the timeline. Certainly, it wouldn't have happened, maybe, it wouldn't have happened on the timeline without the NASA drive to go to the moon. And that's what really funded that revolution in Silicon Valley at the time. Um, now think of that and think of what the technologies we're going to learn, whether it be electric propulsion and all the other myriad of technologies we're going to learn and experience and mature on this next gateway initiative. Yeah. yeah. Last but certainly not least, Penny. Very difficult act to follow. Um, I agree with a lot of the things that people said. The one other thing I want to add is, um, you know, as a teacher, as a university faculty, um, one of the things that I think and makes people more creative is trying to solve problems that are exceptionally hard. And it's not that they're not hard problems on Earth, too, but there's something about figuring out how to uh, do something really ambitious in an environment that you're not used to working in and uh, doing the combination of dealing with people in space and robotics and exploration, putting all those things together, I think will great, uh, create tremendously creative solutions that will benefit all of us and, and help inspire students for studying difficult subjects. Like, why would you want to um, put yourself through an engineering or science program? It's because you can achieve things that other people you know, might like to achieve but can't. So I feel like it's, it's tremendously powerful from that perspective. That's good. So I think it's important um, that, that, that what we're getting at here is not the how, which is what a lot of times NASA focuses on. The question, I think the broader picture is the why. And that's the, that's the question that we need to be able to communicate um, out to not just the United States of America, but all of our international partners and the world at large. The question is why. Um, and, and, and I'll tell you, if you talk to the folks here at NASA, especially in the science mission directorate or the office of the chief scientist, they will tell you raw science. There's so much about our solar system that we can learn from the moon where there is no active atmosphere. There's not, not an active hydrosphere, although we do now know that there is a water cycle there. Um, there's not an active geology, which means whatever impacted the moon a billion years ago is today right where it was a billion years ago. And that includes not just asteroid impacts, it also includes charged particles coming from the sun. Um, so it is a repository of amazing history and science that is largely untouched on the surface of the moon, where if we can get there and get that information, it will be transformative as to how we see, the, as you mentioned, the formation of the solar system. It is also, I think, important to note from a science perspective that on the far side of the moon, it is very quiet from an electromagnetic spectrum perspective, which means we can actually do astrophysics from deep space with really not much technology. We're talking about wire antennas that you know could be kilometers in length to look at these very long wavelengths. Um, I, you know, the uh, when when I say long wavelengths, I'm talking about what used to be light waves from the early universe that have since become, as the universe expanded, long wavelengths that we could, we could actually pick those up on the far side of the moon in a, in a way that we can't pick them up on this side of the moon. So there's astrophysics kind of science that we can get from the moon as well. So it's the, it's the science of the moon, it's the science from the moon from a raw science perspective. Uh, I'll tell you, you walk around the NASA Science Mission Directorate or the Chief Scientist's Office, you will find no shortage of opportunities for science on the moon. Then the next question is, 
what about the human exploration piece? That's critically important as well. We want to go further. We want to go to Mars. The moon is a proving ground. How do we live and work on another world? How do we utilize the resources of the moon, namely the water ice? And, um, and the water ice is not just water to drink, it's air to breathe. It's also hydrogen and oxygen, which is the same fuel that powered the space shuttles, the same fuel that will power the SLS. There's energy on the surface of the moon. And the, the energy is not just water ice, I should say hydrogen and oxygen, it's also solar. We have peaks of eternal light on the surface of the moon where we can have long duration power. Um, so all of this is available there to live, to learn how to live and work on another world so that we can eventually go to Mars. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of, re and by the way, we talk about Mars. Um, just since I've been the NASA administrator, we, we have learned so much about Mars. We, we now know that Mars has liquid water 12 kilometers under its surface. Liquid water 12 kilometers under the surface of Mars. What do we know about water on Earth? Everywhere there's liquid water, there's life. I'm not saying there's life on Mars, but there's liquid water there. The other thing that we know is that Mars used to have an ocean in its northern hemisphere, two thirds of it covered with ocean. It used to have a thick atmosphere and a magnetosphere that protected it from the radiation of deep space and radiation from the sun. We also now know just in the last year uh, that there are complex organic compounds on the surface of Mars. The building blocks of life exist on Mars. They don't exist on the moon, but the building blocks of life are on Mars. I'm not saying there's life there. I don't know, neither does anybody else, but we ought to find out. And the moon is the way that we get to Mars to learn what we need to learn. Um, the idea that the methane cycles of Mars are commensurate with the seasons of Mars doesn't guarantee there's life, but the probability just went up again. So I, I really think that when we talk about exploration, we're answering the question why? There's so much to learn um, and so much to do. And it's who I think humanity always has been. It's Christopher Columbus. It's just a modern day version. Um, but I think answering this question why is um, something that everybody, everybody's gonna come to their own answer on why. And some people, don't really know why, they just know they want to do it. Uh, and <laughs> I'm just being honest. There were people, look, I don't know why, but we, we, we need to go. <laughs> I'm just, you, you, you know those people, they're, they're out there. Yeah. Um, oh, yes. And by the way, they're the biggest fans of NASA. Yep. So uh, they wear the shirts that Krista talked about, and the, and the sneakers with the NASA logos and the coach purses, and et cetera. Um, so anyway, there's, there's, there's lots of opportunity now more than ever. We're at a unique moment. Um, because of the diversity of the astronaut core now, people are gonna see themselves in ways that they've never seen themselves before. And I think that's very positive for our country. And it shows the transformation that our nation has been through. The, the Artemis program is, a, is, is as much about that as it is about all of the science and the exploration and everything else. Lastly, and I'll finish on this. I know my time is out. Um, we go back to Apollo. We think about, and, I, and I've, I've talked about this. I talk about this everywhere I go. This is on NASA TV, so I'm going to say it again. Many of you have already heard me say it. We think about um, the Apollo program and what came from it. The way we communicate, direct TV, dish network, over the horizon communications, XM radio, internet broadband from space. I come from Oklahoma, a lot of rural Oklahomans. You don't have broadband from space. You don't have the internet in many places. That's not just in Oklahoma, it's throughout the entire United States of America, in fact, throughout the entire world. The way we communicate with space-based capabilities is transformative, it has improved the human condition, and there's the little agency, I heard Senator Nelson call NASA this little agency that innovated all of these capabilities back years ago. But it's not just the way we communicate, it's the way we navigate, uh, it's the way we produce food. Uh, I heard somebody earlier talking about uh, how do, uh, what are the technologies that have been advanced? We are, we are now increasing crop yields, decreasing water use, preserving nitrates in the soil in ways that can only happen because of NASA technology. Um, the way we produce food, the way we produce energy, the way we produce energy cleanly, more cleanly than we would otherwise be able to do because of NASA capability and technology. The way we do disaster relief, the way we do national security, um, certainly the way we predict weather I tell you, I spent a couple of nights in the, in the, uh, you know, my my bedroom closet this last weekend because a tornado is hitting Oklahoma. Um, but 
but we were able to have those predictions and hear the sirens and get into the closet. Why? Because NASA technology developed satellite capability that enable us to make those predictions to save lives. And of course, the way we understand climate is available to us because of NASA technology and capability. There's so much more. But all of this was born from this little agency that receives less than less than one half of 1% of the federal budget. And it, it stems largely from the Apollo program in the 1960s. The question is, what, what all are we going to be able to benefit from from the Artemis program? We talk about spin-offs. We talk about the technology development that commercial industry can then license and use in ways that nobody has even imagined yet just like they're using it in ways that nobody imagined during the Apollo era today. So um, there's so many opportunities here, so many reasons to do the exploration, so many reasons to get the science. And um, I think everybody has to answer their own question, why? Uh, and, but we want to give people you know, the, the list of options because there are so many. So anyway, thank you, General Isles, for doing this. This afternoon, I'm not going to be here, but um, I appreciate all of you being here these next couple of days. Uh, to help give us good advice, and that's what we're looking for. We want, we want advice, we want guidance, um, we want unabashed opinions, and we're looking for that. So thank you guys so much. Jim, thank you very much, and thanks for your leadership. And talk about a great leadership technique, getting the comments from each one of us around the table. Uh, you heard the elements of the, the elevator speech that we'll pull together, if you will. That's, awesome. This is a fantastic technique. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your leadership. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to break for